Today I'm going to talk about lattice energy in the Born-Haber cycle, and this is all in relation to ionic compounds and the energy that it takes to form ionic compounds, and also the energy that it's released to make ionic compounds, because it's a very energetically favorable operation. And the reason for that is because a positive and a negative charge will electrostatically attract together and when they form this compound then energy will be released or if i look at it the way that i've written here then if i have a solid ionic compound if i wanted to break it apart into its component ions i would have to put energy in in order to make that happen that energy that i would put in to break it apart is called the lattice energy and if I was to think about this in the opposite direction, if I was forming that solid from these ions, then um, that would be kind of the negative lattice energy. And this is sort of the internal energy of an ionic compound, the internal energy of a system. So sometimes your lattice energy is abbreviated with a capital U, which we see also with internal energies in various thermodynamic type equations as well. So same sort of idea. It's an internal energy of a system in the formation or breaking apart, depending on which way you're going. In this way, this would be a positive U. Or if I was thinking about it in the opposite direction, we know that we can think about these equations as reversed. If I was to flip these guys around, that would give me the negative lattice energy to, uh, to form this solid compound. So um, this is useful information. Um, this is really comes about, this internal energy kind of comes about, and this is a plus U, so this would be a delta H is equal to plus U. So sorry, that's a little bit confusing. Off to the side, it's not part of the equation there. I just realized that it might look like I was adding U on there. Um, so when I'm looking at the lattice energy here, it really is coming about between a maxine and a minine, maximum and minine of my ions here. Um, we're maximizing the attraction we're minimizing the repulsion. So in the organization and orderliness of these ionic compounds, as they're forming these crystalline solids, then we get some energy that is released. Okay, that's lattice energy. Now, in order to calculate that lattice energy, or if we know it in order to calculate the formation of, of this solid, the energy that's associated with that, we can use what is called the Born-Haber cycle, or the Born-Haber cycle. Um, so Haber or Haber is the, the same Fritz Haber as we see in the Haber-Bosch process, which is the formation of ammonia from nitrogen and hydrogen gas. And then he um, was associated with this other chemist, and they were looking at the energies of uh, the formation of these ionic compounds. And what they did is used Hess's law of heat summation to find either one or the other. So you can, if you know the energy of each of the steps of the process, these are state functions, so regardless of the path that it takes to get there, if I sum together all these energies, then I should be able to find the sum of a target reaction. So that would be the target reaction in the formation of the ionic compound. Or if I don't know the lattice energy, but I do know the heat of formation, maybe I put it into a calorimeter, I actually measured that heat of formation, which is what I'll show you in the example coming up, um, then I can calculate the lattice energy. So that's kind of a nice way to do that as well. So the Born-Haber cycle is really useful and it uses steps that kind of synthesize a lot of the ideas that we've talked about in a lot of prior videos. So let's talk about this target reaction then. So we're forming this solid, we're forming lithium bromide and we're doing that from its elements. So we have our solid lithium metal and we have uh, diatomic bromine, which is a liquid. It's one of our two liquids at standard conditions. So I react these two together. I end up with lithium bromide. So the first step in that, if we're kind of thinking about stepwise process, because we're going to use Hess's law, so we need to think about the energy of each of these steps. And if I add together the energies of those, I should end up with the energy of my total. So the first step is the sublimation of the metal. And we're sublimating it because we want it in the gas phase because the gas phase elements are going to be the ones that do the most interesting thermodynamic kind of chemistry, right? Gas phase, anything is going to move about more. That's what kinetic molecular theory says, is that everything is always moving around. And we have these ways of measuring the energy of these more easily than we can when they're in solid forms. So we're first going to sublimate the metal. And the energy that's associated with that is the energy of this phase change. So when I look up the delta H for sublimation here to go from a solid to a gas or to go from a solid to a liquid, liquid to a gas, 
then I end up with a delta H of positive 161 kilojoules per mole. Again, this is look upable because it's just the energy that it takes to sublimate. Now step two, I need to break apart my diatomic. So in this case, I have a diatomic halogen. So I need to break apart my diatomic and then either sublimate it if it's a solid, like iodine, for example, is a solid of my halogens, it's diatomic. I'd have to break it into pieces and then get it into the gaseous phase. Or evaporation, like in the case of my bromine here, it's going to go from the liquid phase to the gas phase, but I still have to break it apart. I want individual component pieces. So I'm going to go from my one half of my diatomic bromine here to a bromine that is in the gas phase. So I had to kind of do two pieces to this. I had to put in enough energy to break this bond, because if I'm thinking about the Lewis dot structure of this thing, I have two bromines, there's my dots. So I had to not only break this bond, but I also had to go from the liquid phase to the gas phase. So there's kind of two pieces to that. And when I did that, then that amount of energy is 14.98 kilojoules per mole. Again, look up a mole. Now we're going to take our metal, so we have gaseous lithium at this point, and we're going to ionize it. So we're going to rip away that first electron on there. So I'm going to go from lithium to lithium plus one in the gas phase. And when I do that, then the electron I can write as a product here. So it's an oxidation reaction, right? Oxidation is loss. So we lose this electron. The energy that goes into that of this process is called the ionization energy. In this case, the first ionization energy. Because I'm just ripping away the first electron. If I was doing the second, then I would do the first and the second, right? I need to get rid of as many as there are electrons. So when I look up the first ionization energy for lithium, it's 520 kilojoules per mole. Again, look upable. So now I have a positive cation, I need to do the same thing to my bromine. So my bromine is going to become bromide. So I'm going from gaseous bromine, I'm going to add an electron to it so it's being reduced to form gaseous bromide. So this reduction process uh, is going to uh, going to release some energy. Actually, this is kind of a favorable thing. And this has to do with the electron affinity. This is the negative electron affinity. Because uh, the electron affinity is how much energy it takes to uh, rip away an electron once I already have a negative ion that's formed, so from an anion. So it would be thinking about this reaction in the opposite direction. So we're looking at a negative electron affinity here. So when I look that up for bromine, it's negative 325 kilojoules per mole. And what that really tells me from a theoretical standpoint is that bromine really likes to be bromide, right? This process is going to happen quite favorably and energy is released in the process. Okay, now we need to go to step five, which is the formation of the solid from the gaseous ion. So now I have lithium plus one in the gaseous state, and I have bromide in the gaseous state, and now I'm going to form lithium bromide. And I will form the solid. Now that formation of the solid is the lattice energy that we were talking about, and it's actually going to be the negative lattice energy because this is the opposite of the way that I wrote it out initially, right? When I was talking about it before, I said the lattice energy is the amount of energy it takes to break this apart. So we're going to take the negative lattice energy here, which we just called U, confusingly, because of course U is the internal energy, which fits, but you know, I feel like the capital U is sort of what we use when we run out of variables. And now, <laughs> with all those steps, with all these steps combined, I add together all of my reactants, kind of going back here, all of the reactants, and then they form all of my products. And if you recall from Hess's law of heat summation, then I can eliminate what I have in common on both sides. And so long as I end up with that target reaction that I was looking for to start off with, 
which is this guy, then if I take the sum of all the heats along the way, then that should give me the heat of the overall reaction, and that's what we're really looking for. So let's sum these guys up. So I've taken all of my reactants, all of my products, and I want to get rid of the things that are in common on both sides. So I see here that I have kind of lithium gas, and I have bromine gas, and I have an electron because I gained one, lost one, end up with gaseous lithium plus, gaseous bromide, and then what I have left over in my net or the target is my lithium solid plus my half bromine gives me lithium bromide. Okay, so when I add together all of those delta H's along the way, so the first ionization energy for lithium, the sublimation energy, the breaking apart of the bromine as well as um, evaporating it, uh, the negative electron affinity, and the lattice energy, then I add those all together and I end up with 371 minus U, right, U for my internal energy, kilojoules per mole. So now if I say, well, I don't know what U is. So there are ways, though, that I could figure out the overall heat of this reaction. I could put these guys into a calorimeter, which is a thing that measures heat, and figure out how much heat I get when I form this solid. So I take it and I look at the difference in the temperature when these things dissolve, and I end up with a delta H. So let's say we use our calorimeter, and experimentally we determine that the delta H of formation is negative 350 kilojoules per mole. So we went into the lab, we measured this amount, and now if we set this equal to this, then we end up with a U that is equal to 721 kilojoules per mole. That's my lattice energy there. So that's the amount of energy that it would take to break apart and form the gaseous ions from the solid ionic compound. Or if I have the negative of this, this is the amount of energy that would be released when I form this thing. Okay, so this is my lattice energy that I solved for here. Lattice energy. Okay, so kind of a big rigmarole, but it sort of combines together a lot of different ideas. This brings in things like redox, it brings in things like the formation of ions and really understanding the attraction between oppositely charged um, species. Um, it looks at the different elemental values, it looks at different enthalpies, it's looking at periodic trends. So this idea, this Born-Haber cycle, kind of combines together a lot of different chemical concepts and it gives you interesting information at the end. Either we can get a lattice energy if we have some sort of experimentally determined value, like in this particular example, or if I knew the lattice energy, I could figure out the overall enthalpy for that process by just summing them all together using Hess's Law. As always, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out. Otherwise, I will talk to you again soon.